Hello, I'm your host, Leonard Duncan. Welcome to a new episode of ATV Talk and Motorsports Podcast. Please join us every Tuesday at 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. We bring you interviews with industry professionals, live events, live news about the motorsports industry in every episode. Enjoy the show. Whether we are out riding with our friends and family or racing in extreme environments, we all need good tires. That's why I recommend GBC Power Sports Tires, a division of Green Ball Corp. Their products, which include XC Master, Mini Master, and Ground Buster 3, are what leading professionals in the ATV UTV industry are using. You can get your tires at greenballtires.com or find them on Instagram as GBC Tires for further inquiries. Corey Witherall, thank you for coming back to ATV Talk. How are you, brother? I'm doing well. And yourself? I'm doing great. You know, last time we talked, we covered so much of your career and we just skimmed across the surface. And, you know, I don't think we did your ATV portion of your career justice. So what I'd really like to know is a little bit more about, you know, you seem to have a love for ATVs like I do. And I want to know a little bit more about the time you got to spend on the back of a, of a quad. And um, in your words, tell us what, it, what it's all about. I know you met Brian Fry that way and he helped you at Ascot Park so that you could race. Um, and that formed a friendship with, with your family and his. And um, I just want you to give us, uh, give us the rundown. Well, yes. I mean, it, it's pretty much something that that was introduced to me as a young child. I mean, like you said something before, I said that how my first time on ATV was just on a family vacation up in, in Lake Arrowhead. And at that time, I mean, I was really into dirt bikes. So I was looking at, you know, 10-year-old, 12-year-old, just looking through the magazines, like motocross magazines, three-wheelers and ATVs. So at that time, I mean, three-wheelers were... were the end thing, the big thing, and that's, you know, what I looked at in life and I always had the interest, but then the ATVs, you know, started coming out. And, you know, when Suzuki came out with the, with the quad race in 85, I was just kind of like, that's what I want. That's what I want to do. Not, not really the three wheeler thing anymore. And just, you know, looking at the magazines and, and was it back then, uh, cycle news, you know, the little local newspaper or motorcycle newspaper, I think it was. I would always read them and look at the articles and, and see like all the ATV stuff. And, you know, for me as a child at that time, I used to you know, look at the magazines and always see Denton in there and, and Brian Fry in there doing the Suzuki quad cross, you know, when I was like 13, 14 years old. And I always wanted to do it and everything. So before I met Brian, I actually knew who he was and everything. And, as me racing at Ascot, I would always see him down there with them and everything. And, and he's the one that kind of approached me because I had issues with my, with my bike that night and everything. And that's how we formed a friendship and a, and a relationship over the years. But it just, it's always been an interest for me to get in with the ATV racing and, and just, you know, do, the stadium racing, I guess, was really what I wanted to do. Um, because even before I got involved, like I said, when I was young, I used to go to all the Supercross races and used to go to the Mickey Thompson races. And so that, so again, with the Suzuki Quadcross, I used to watch that there at the Supercross races at the Coliseum. And for me, I was like, that would be cool one day to do it. That would be awesome. So it just was, you know, that interest as a young child and then when i got a little bit older and everything and got a quad racer at 250 it just went from there and everything you know it was kind of i was pretty stoked because i was just like man this thing's like badass this quad and everything and <laughs> it was a lot different from my suzuki 185 i had so it was just a whole different animal a whole different machine and you know, looking at Brian Fry in the, in the magazines and newspapers and, and Denton, you know, it was just kind of like, that's what I wanted to do. And then when I, 
met Brian, I mean, that was, that just changed everything, you know, he, he introduced me to everybody in the, in the industry and introduced me to a lot of the top writers and, you know, I became friends with like Andrew Buck and, you know, Denton and Marilyn Knowles and just everyone in that whole scene. Because I was, it was almost like I was kind of like a little brother. Like he was like dragging me along with him. <laughs> you know, we were, we were kind of like together in a sense. And everything. He was just like the older brother because they were all in their, you know, uh, early mid twenties. And I was just 14, just turned 15. So it was, you know, that kind of like how that whole start, thing started for me and just, you know, evolved from there. Did you do much amateur racing? You know what they, so I think it was uh, CMC that ran the, that ran the series back then or the local races. They had like four groups. They had like beginner, junior, intermediate, and pro. And I just went ahead straight into the junior class that first year and everything. So I did that that first year. Then the next year I went intermediate or amateur, whatever, depending on what, what sanctioning body it was. But also, I started eighty in eighty eight. I started uh, did a few of the Mickey Thompson races at that time. But they had like the Rose Bowl and the Coliseum in Anaheim, I think, in eighty eight. Those are the best places to go. Yeah, the Coliseum. I mean, that that place. Even to this day, I mean, that's like the best track out of all. I mean, it wasn't really too technical. It was just awesome to go up the peristyle and jump right back down <laughs> you know it's just like a complete free free fall from the very top down to the bottom and you just launch and everything <laughs> i never i never got to go um and ride the courses um i only got to be a spectator and i loved i loved that it was just so unbelievable it, you know, uh, I'm a young, I'm in my 20s working on these guys' bikes that are still superstars to me, you know, Charlie Shepard and uh, Mark Earhart and, and just, you know, you, you, I can go on and on and on. And your my eyes would still get big when I'd walk into that stadium, you know, the Rose Bowl or, or the Coliseum and just, wow, just an utter wow. Couldn't believe I was there. Yeah, no, it's it's pretty. Like I said, when when I'm, for me watching it as a young kid, before I got into racing, going to Supercrosses and Mickey Thompson races, and then my first time there it was just like I said, I walked in like, this is awesome. Like this is this is totally cool. You know, I think the only other track I got that same feeling for me as a racer was my first day walking in, into in, down through Gasoline Alley at Indianapolis on the front straightaway. Looking down the straight one way, looking down the other way, going, holy shit. <laughs> you know, I'm actually yeah. doing this. So, for my first time going to the Coliseum for the Mickey Thompson race to actually do the race, you know, standing on top of the peristyle, looking out over stands of 100,000 you know, out there and going, wow, I'm actually doing this. So, I think those are really the only two times I had that same feeling of walking to a, to a track. Now, I've raced a lot of great tracks all across the country. But those are the two that actually gave me that kind of like, I guess, a pinch me moment kind of thing. Did you did you have many nerves when you were going to go into the first portions of riding in the Mickey's? Did you have any nerves? Like, yeah, were you really nervous? No, no. I mean, a little bit like we talked, like we discussed before in the past and everything with racing. You know, you learn how to put those aside and everything, you know, you learn how to deal what's, what's in going forward. And I, I, myself, I know myself well enough to where I can control a lot of the, the nerves, I guess, and the butterflies and everything to where it didn't really get in my way to distract what I need to do and everything. You know, I know a lot of people get nervous or get like start pacing back and forth and get anxious, but I've always been able to keep like really cool. Even even like even like my rookie year at Indianapolis, you know, I qualified on bump day. So that's like you know, it would take thirty-three cars and there was like 
I don't know, like 45 guys entered for the race. So they're only taking the 33 fastest. And I went in the race, bumping out and bumping out three guys or, or one guy to get into the race. But I was far enough up, up above the ladder to where I wasn't sitting on the, what they call the bubble, the 33rd spot and everything. So we were just all fighting for it. And the last day on bump day, you're fighting for that last day or that last spot or whatever. You, start, you just keep on knocking out the slower car. <laughs> is what right. You, so you got still 10 more guys waiting there to qualify and they keep on going and running out, bumping out that slower guy. So I bumped my way in, but I got far enough ahead to where I, I you know, we had like, I think, uh, an hour left, which is what they call happy hour. Track condition changes on the speedway. It gets faster at that time. So that's when they, that's when bump day really kicks in. And that's kind of like for a driver, that's like the most intense moment in any guy trying to qualify for Indy is on bump day that final hour. Because the way the sun's setting in the west and the big bleachers down the front straightaway, it just casts a big shadow over the track. So when that shadow comes over the track, the track temperature cools down and the air temperature cools down. So that's when the, the engine comes alive and you got more grip and you're doing faster speeds. And that's when everybody starts going faster. <laughs> but when, 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 I, when I, so I guess, I guess we kind of take a long story here, but that day is the most nerve wracking, you know, stressful day to anybody. But I just sat there and got in my car and, it just so happened right when ESPN went live at the speedway for that final hour, which like I said, they call happy hour. And it just, uh, they opened the broadcast with, with the camera right in my face. It's like, this is the first card going out in happy hour. And I went out there and uh, who had bumped out? Japanese driver Shigeki Hattori at that time. And I was above Alonzo Jr. So I kind of said to myself, I guess this part kept me cool. I was like, Alonzo Jr. is not going to get bumped out of this race. And I'm faster than him. I think I'm good, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I just kept watching the. They just kept watching the times and everything, and you know, you know, I kept it cool and everything. And I was confident enough, but that would probably be the most stressful time anyone's racing is qualifying for the five hundred. How many guys can they run in an hour? A complete run for qualifying. You have your outlap. And then it depends on weather conditions. They might give you one or two laps to warm up. If it's really, if it's cold, they'll give you extra laps just to get more heat in the tires. But you're pretty much full throttle the minute you leave the gate all the way around. Then you come by, then the next time by you'll get like the checker flag. So you have kind of like almost two laps to get up to speed. Then you have to do four laps and each lap is about it, I mean, I don't know what they're, exactly what they're doing now, but at that time, they're about like 38, 39 second lap times. You know, it's a two and a half mile oval when you're doing that in 38 seconds. I think today's mm -hmm. is about like 37 seconds or something like that. But you have to do four laps. So, <laughs> so man. So, in time wise, you can run a car, you know, four minutes. But when you get to like the mad rush at the end there, sometimes if you're not up to speed on your first lap or second lap, when they know it's not going to be fast enough to bump somebody out, the team will either wave the, wave the yellow flag and pull their guy off the track, or if it's coming like a, to the very end where they want to get somebody else to try to qualify, the officials might throw a black flag, kind of like, dude, you're not going to get in at those speeds. Let's give somebody else a try. So. No. Do they? Well, we're getting off track. I want to talk about quads. Yeah. I mean, that's interesting, but um, <clears throat> so you got to race most all of your racing on the West Coast, right? Yeah, majority of my racing was all through California and, and Arizona, and um, just going back and forth in northern Northern California and Southern California. We went up to like Marysville and you know, like Brentwood and. Porterville and kind of everything else in between there in, in, the, in the Central Valley. But I did do, I did, I did go back to Loretta. I went to, uh, did a few nationals. I went to, I think, Tennessee. And um, I went to Florida to, uh, who was it, Gainesville or something. 
went back there and I you know, went to Texas for for you know, both motocross and, and TT at was it Boyd's. What class did you ride back there? Uh, was it pro am or amateur? Whatever's below pro. Pro am. Yeah. So that was in uh. 88, 88, I think I went to Texas, and then 89, I went to those other ones. I think 89, yeah, so when I went to Loretta. Florida, that was in 90. Florida, I was going to do all Mickey's and, and run all the nationals, but the first national, I broke my broke my forearm. It was kind of, we it was a TT race, so we're going into the first turn. We guys are running like around fourth or fourth or fifth or something like that or the guy behind me there's so much dust because it's like the last race of the day or something about five o'clock in the afternoon and we're going into the the sun as it's setting into the west so it was just dust all over the place and you could barely see anybody in front of you and i guess the guy behind me didn't see us all breaking or didn't break when we were because you're just using the side records because of dust and just climb up the rear tire of me and we all went cartwheeling down the front straight away yeah so I had a bike land on my forearm and broke the two bones and had surgery that night in uh, in Tallahassee. So that wasn't a, that wasn't a great way to start the year, was it? No, that actually that accident ended my my ATV career. <laughs> so I mean, because you, when you have metal in your arm and everything, and I had two plates and fourteen screws and. Doctors are saying, you know, if you crash again and break break it in that same point or the same area, it will just shatter your your the bones in that whole area. And when that happens, they'll be in smaller pieces and they may not be able to put it back together. So when you're a young 17, 18 year old, you don't want to hear that and everything. You know, is I right. like, like, lose my arm possibly? It's like, nah, I'm not gonna do that. Wow. That, that was the first race actually that my parents did not go to and my mom and dad went to see uh my dad's parents in arizona and that's why they didn't go and i was like ah, don't worry i'm good you know you know i got a, you know everybody there you know like roger housley was there and just a lot of west coast guys were there and, and um you know it was almost like being at a home race and everything so i was like i got it i'm cool but that happened and my mom spent all night flying flying from Arizona to get to me and everything. And after that she said like like we're never gonna miss a race. <laughs> and it's true. That's, it was, that, I mean that's great. That's great that they were so into it and wanted to support you. Yeah. You know, it's it's too bad because I really felt that, you know. The year before uh in running the mickeys in 89 of the year before that you know i got the fastest qualifier at, at the la coliseum i uh, beat john hemi i think it was like by a hundredth of a second to get that so i knew there, there i mean i mean everyone that, that worked around me knew that i had that potential and i could go from there it just you know at that time i was in high school and still dealing with that but in 90 that was the year i graduated from high school so it's kind of like all right now i'm going to go full full bar and everything in 90 get get the feel for everything they come 91 they don't have any distractions my way that's when i'm going to really really you know move really you know focus on the whole professional level but the accident you know kind of put that away but i mean it opened doors for me in a different avenue which you know had I not crashed and broken my arm, who knows? I may have never been down that same road to go on my way to do the Indy 500 and all the other types of forms of racing I've done. You know, I could, yeah, that's <laughs> that, that's true. I was until I was 25, until you know, the late 90s or something, or mid 90s. Were any of the guys that you, that you knew and met through IndyCar? Did any of them know anything about quads or? ATVs. Uh, you know, a few, a few guys. Yeah, as far as like the whole, you know, nationals and stuff like that, and you know, they know about Mickey Thompson's. You know, mainly the guys on the West Coast did because you know Mickey's was mainly on the West Coast. But you know, everybody. I mean, 
when you think of Mickey Thompson, though, you think of the stadium trucks and, and you know, the, the factory winner teams like Toyota and Ford. And you know, everybody knew who Roger Mears and Ivan Stewart and, and Walker Evans. So, so when it came to um, talking quads, you know, the, the, the guys who were motocross guys or uh, were into motocross knew, knew about the stuff, about the ATV racing and, and everything. So, wow, but, that's it's crazy. But stadium racing was cool. I mean, it was it was a whole it's a whole different animal from from outdoor racing. I mean, I was I was just actually talking to um, someone last night and everything about stadium racing, how it's just different from you know outdoors and and even back then, you know, tracks are different today versus back then. I mean, today you have you have nice polished tracks. Today, where back then you ran a race after like. 10 motocross heat races <laughs> where it's all rutted out. Yeah, they didn't, they, they didn't groom. And, and I, I tell the kids that I talk to that are racing motocross, I says, you guys have no idea. He says, yeah. we didn't get groom tracks. Yeah. You know, they didn't go out and till it before practice and, and it was all awesome and smooth. And it, it, no, it was what it was. And you just wrote it. Yeah. Well, it's like, it's like Blythe, you know, the, the big Blythe race was at the Cal Fleming Memorial race. That track was awesome. Just big rolling hills through the desert and natural terrain. But they had like a lot of big jumps, big doubles, big table toss. But they also ran quads with motorcycles. <laughs> like we were saying, you know, you got the doubles, which I think it are, they were like, what, 85 feet apart? I mean, they're huge. It's either like, you know, you got big balls or little balls and whether you're going to do it or not. And my first time there was actually with Brian Fry and everything. And that was in 87. And he kind of told me, he's like, no, if you're going to win, you got to do the doubles. <laughs> you know, that, that was kind of like the model of going to win, you got to do the doubles. And I think I was the only one in the amateur class that actually was doing the doubles there. Because all the pros were and everything, but you know, you have to be like fucking wide open and hit it. But the problem was you're going down. I, remember, I vaguely remember you have to go down, down this like into this valley or a little small canyon and you come up top of the hill. Then right when you cross it, there was like a left turn. And then you just got to pin it from there and hit that double like wide open, you know, just the tallest gear you have and not lift because or you know, back out of the throttle or anything because you you know you're either gonna case it or or plan it right in the second one mm. but you have to do it and everything and carry enough momentum up that hill and churn and rotate quick enough to get back to get back on the full throttle because if you don't then you're not gonna have enough runway speed to get the speed that you need to clear it and like we were saying earlier you didn't have you know you didn't have the green track to do it or a green line. You just did that race right after, like I said, 10 motocross races where there's like five ruts going through that turn. Right. <laughs> and bumps going all the way up, up, uh, up the valley, up the hill and everything to, to make that left turn. I mean, if you watch, you watch like the old videos on YouTube uh, during the Golden State Nationals at Carlsbad, you know, they, if you notice, there's like one video I saw on there. I think like Jimmy White was in there and, and all of them and everything. It was all, I think it was like in 86, I think that the one that I saw in the video. But that race was like the last race of the day. You can tell just by the glare of the sunlight and everything, you know, the shadows that they casted over Carlsbad. And that was after all the motocross races, after the 250 Pro, because actually, yeah, because they showed like Jim Holly on that and everything. And, you just see all the ruts as they're going up the hill and coming down the hill and was it devil's drop or something they called it and it was just yeah i remember that track is all beat up and this is just like you know <laughs> and you're going wide open over that you know i raced at carlsbad a lot and motorcycles and three-wheelers and four-wheelers i never ever remember seeing a tractor when they when they ran tt they had a like a um a mattress spring the springs inside the mattress that they would drag the tt course with 
Okay. And, and they put a little water on it so it would harden up, you know, so that we could blue groove it. And it, it lasted and held up really well. But in in any of the off-road stuff or the motocross stuff that we raced there, there were no nothing. They, they didn't have any equipment to do it. Yeah. Yeah, I've never seen that. The only thing I've seen was like a water truck. And that water truck only sprayed certain areas. Yeah, because they had a sprinkler system and they wouldn't turn it on during the day. Yeah. And they only, you got it in the morning. When you got there in the morning, there were sections of that track that were soup. Yeah. And that's all the flat part in the bottom. Yeah. Because <laughs> all the water ran from the top and came back down. <laughs> exactly. And you just had to deal with it. I mean, some of the mud holes were still there at the end of the day. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that um, if you look at the talent that these people have today, they are very talented, and they're riding machines that are incredibly well suspended. Uh, the motor packages or the motors they get to run are, are, are way better than anything that we that we got to use back in the eighties and nineties. And I would I would love to bring the fast guys of today back to that era and let them ride those machines and say, now this is, this is where the men and boys get separated. <laughs> Which are you? It was to do that Carl's better Raceway. <laughs> oh yeah. I mean, it's just <laughs> incredible. Did you get to spend much time at Carlsbad? Yeah. I raced every time we were able to, uh, whenever they had a CMC race, I was down there. That was, that was like my favorite track. You know, yeah. it's funny because even with all the other type of racing, you know, there's tracks I I love to hate, but they actually the tracks that are my favorite. You know, I, and I think that's just the more difficult, challenging ones. So, right. so like Carlsbad, I mean, you have to be in shape to to really you know handle that track. I mean, the, like we were talking about with the the ruts and the bumps and everything. I mean, that track's not built for for quads or anything like that. So that was kind of like my favorite track, you know, to, to race at and everything. Um, Thunderize out in Atalanta was one of my favorite tracks. I hated it, but I loved it. <laughs> you know, I never. It was like 110 degrees, but that was also another track that was just brutal. I mean, it was rough as hell because you got hard packed dirt, then you got sand that just digs up big ruts and everything, and then you got more hard pack and then the watering system was the same like Carlsbad. I mean, some areas was like a soup and another area was just dry as the desert. Right. So, I mean. I, we got to run, um, I, I never really liked Atalanto. I, I, I never, ever, the, the few times that I raced it, had good luck there. It was always something, I always had something go wrong, you know, whether it be me, me crashing or, or, you know, the one year battery cable came off, you know, and, and you just, I just never had a good vibe there. I just never, never really liked racing there. Yeah. Yeah. I, I ate it pretty bad there for one race. And I kind of like, after that race, I was kind of like, I don't know if I really like this track anymore. But I, cause I don't know if you remember, but they had this one area of part section of the track in the back where they kind of made their own like, Canyon, their own little valley. It was like just like a big ditch, like a twenty foot ditch in there, and they just dug out with a tractor. So it's kind of like a, almost like a small peristyle, you know, like a coliseum peristyle jump where you mm -hmm. kind of on top, and then you're jumping down to this man made ditch and everything. But it was just like a run it out deal once, and I came flying in there and landed right where everybody else is landed, and it just paced it and just went over the bars and tumbled all the way down, and yeah. We kind of after that, I, was kind of like, I don't know if I like the track anymore. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't it wasn't that much fun. Yeah. We were there. We were there one year, and Grunlin, Nick Grunlin, was he was flying. Um, he was in the the lead group, I believe. Uh, I don't remember the whole story, and he hit a, an edge, and it threw him on the ground pretty hard. Um, we all. He didn't. I, he didn't finish. I, I think he took an ambulance ride that day. Um, you know, we were all pretty concerned because, dude, he was on the gas, and it, that edge just freaking. He hit it. He hit it rear the rear tires, and it just 
pitched him right over the bars, you know, and then I think the quad slammed him. Uh, I mean, he probably could remember it and tell it better than I can because uh, I got it secondhand. But I, I know that when he didn't come back around, that guy was a tough dude. And if he didn't get up and come back around, it had to have hurt. Yeah. Yeah, that, that, that place would do it just because, like I said, I mean, it's just super rough with the the sand and, and the hard packed dirt that, that kind of intermixes with the natural desert terrain. Yeah, they have they still have that race uh now and again, but it's not the same because there's housing developments and things like that. Um but they but they they still have it every once in a while. I think it's I think it's still a yearly event, but I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah, I drove by there um not too long ago, like a couple months ago, just cutting through from San Bernardino to going through the across the desert and i was driving up the 395 and i was like well that track is still there <laughs> yeah the track right off the side and everything off the I think it was 395 that main highway yeah they I, well they called the one track 395 uh there's a motocross track out there and um that that was they had a huge tabletop and um the wind would get kicking up out there and Dustin Nelson is one of the guys that uh, was racing at the time said that he hated it because you had to jump. You had to make sure you jumped into the wind and it would push you back on the, onto the course. Cause you were basically jumping off into the desert and it would bring you back onto the course. And, and he says, well, if the gust died when you were in the air, you were flat landing out in the desert. <laughs> yeah. Wasn't a lot of some of the guys didn't like it at all. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I wouldn't have. Yeah, th there's a lot of good tracks. Like, like I said, you know, like we we're talking about Blythe. Blythe was like one of my favorite tracks. And everything and that was always just a good, good, fun place to go racing. You know, Blythe, and of course, you know, of course, Ascot. So like Ascot, I, mean, I was at Ascot like every Friday night, and that was like a, you know, a fun track to go race. And that was that was motocross. Yeah, the Friday night motocross. How was the lights? The lights there were okay. I mean, you could see where you're going, but I mean, it could have been brighter. <laughs> so well, they didn't have LEDs back then. Yeah, well, because it was it was so Ascot was uh, a half mile dirt track. And yes, they, and then they had like a, I think a quarter mile dirt track inside the half mile track, so the motocross track kind of zigzagged between the the quarter mile track, and they used the front straightaway or had like a big PT tabletop on the front straight off to the side of the front straightaway. So whenever the track went to the edge of the quarter mile dirt track. It was always bright with lights, but then when the track kind of went into the infield of the quarter mile track, there was like really no lighting. Because in the infield part, they had the bathroom. So like after you at the gate, you went down at the end of the straightaway. You made a like a left turn. They went through these big rolling jumps that kind of was above like the quarter mile track. Then you made a right turn and went into the infield, and then right there were all the bathrooms and everything right there. And that part, that whole spot was all dark because <laughs> the lights, you know, with the dirt track were mainly focused on around the around the quarter mile, not in so much in the infield. Right. They weren't gonna they weren't gonna spend any money to make the lights better because the draw wasn't big enough. Yeah. But it was yeah. For us, I mean, because for me, I did it every I did it every week, every Friday night, just because I looked at it as like another another way to go practice. You know, it was just more practice time. And then I raced every, pretty much every Sunday somewhere, somewhere in uh, California. That's that's an awesome, awesome schedule. Um, yeah, I got to my dad raced at Ascot, and I got to go and watch a flat track race up there um, when Honda was was supporting a team um, back in the eighties, right before they closed down. Yeah. It was, a, it was a really iconic thing because you hear stories about it, you know, all my, as in my childhood was hearing stories about it. And as, 
I, I late teens, I got to go and uh, see it. I didn't get to race there, but I got to go see it. And uh, I thought that was pretty special, pretty cool. Yeah. Well, I mean, like, they also had, um, you know, so, like, Brian Fry, he, you know, he put on Speedway Nights there, too, at, on the Speedway track, out on the, just on the side of the Ascot Park area. There was, they had, like, you know, a motorcycle Speedway track. So, so we would I would do those, too, whenever he had his little Speedway series going around at the, at the track there. How did you like, how did you like TT? I like TT a lot. You know, I, I really enjoyed it. I mean, I wish, wish could have done more of it or, you know, I, the first time I did it was in Bakersfield. And again, that was like, you know, in, uh, when I first met Brian, I mean, like I said, I kind of, Brian took me under his wing kind of thing, you know, I went all over the place and Brian told me where all the, all the good tracks to go to and all the different riding styles and, you know, because of him, he told me about Bakersfield and, and he's like, you know, we're all racing on Bakersfield, you should come out for, for that and everything. I was like, all right, I'll do it. So, you know, we went to a lot of races together and we went to like, I think like El Centro. I mean, I don't know, we <laughs> went everywhere. I don't remember all the races, but I mean, that's how like, like I said, how I got to know everybody in the industry or at least all the guys from that time who were transitioning out of three wheelers into four wheelers and and all the young guys starting out and Mickey's and stuff. And did did you race a three wheeler at all? No, no, just smarter I, than most, huh? <laughs> I I I you know I think I was well. I rode one and everything, and it was all right. It was fun. I had a good time, but. I was boy at that time. I was already ridden you know, four wheelers through ATVs or whatever, and I was just kind of like I like the four wheelers better. Yeah, some people do that, and then I still talk to some guys that are diehard three wheeler guys, um, and you know they're building custom frames for them now and building real aftermarket three wheelers where they're putting the dirt bike motors in them, and and I just think. Man, that is a lot of horsepower for a three wheeler. Yeah, you know, <laughs> with this little thing that that we're putting together and stuff. So I've been having a lot of conversations with guys from back then, and emails exchanging and text messages, and you know, we would get start talking about little stories, and you know, they'll tell me little little things about three wheelers or about a race or something like that. You know. Like Mike Co and I yesterday were emailing back and forth, and he was telling me about some story or some race with him and Denton and everything. When he, you know, was big racing at the Mickey Thompson race in Pomona, and who was else? Uh, um, uh, somebody, uh, Frank Pertelli called me the other day. We we're sitting <laughs> talking. He was telling me because I only knew him a little bit from from ATVs, but he was like, "Yeah, no, I started off with three wheelers and." He's like, no, I just recently went out riding one, like, or did like a race, so fairly recently. And he's just like, just telling me about it. He's like, yeah, I don't still know. I mean, could keep the front end down and everything. He's like, have you ever ridden one? I was like, not nothing like, <laughs> nothing like that, like a 250R or anything like that, more just like a little like 125 three wheeler. But he's like, I can't imagine riding. He's like, yeah, you just would slide those things around all the time. <laughs> he's like, but I kept on getting bite and lifting the front end up. I couldn't, even, <laughs> couldn't even do it. And, so it's, it's kind of interesting. I'm having a lot of three wheeler conversations lately. You know, like Dean Sando, Sando whatever, sent me a couple pictures of everything yesterday of a well, three wheeler from 1978. <laughs> and from the yeah. so it's, it's so, so now it's actually kind of funny because now I'm kind of more interested in, in what is, I guess, just everything about that. We're trying to put together a deal with. Um some of the different three wheeler builders to meet up in Arizona and, and, you know, I, I don't want to critique the comparison, you know, where we're picking the best one. I want to just see the differences and ride some of them just to see what they're like. Um, because the guys that are spending time with, you know, where they throw their legs over them all the time are telling me how great they are and they'll do this and they'll do that. Well, I want to see it up close and personal for myself. And, and, you know, I don't get to ride much and, and I do have a little bit of a limit, a limitation. 
but I can't wait. I just want to go. I got to ride uh, a CRF three wheeler for like 200 yards. And the only reason I rode it 200 yards is because my dumbass didn't put a helmet on and I had no gear. And I just, I, I clicked one gear. I clicked the into third and it just, it just spun around so nice and easy. I downshifted and, and kind of idled it back and gave it back to the guy and says, yeah, this is the dumbest thing in the world to turn me loose on that, especially with no riding gear on and, and not, you know, cause I'm a stickler for, you know, safety. You gotta be, you, you gotta be safe. I mean, you don't want to, you don't want to show the, the young, the youth out there, you're riding with no helmet or doing something stupid like that. So, you know, I was kind of being a hypocrite, you know, yelling at people to put a helmet on and I, and I did it with no helmet. So, um, I can't wait to, to get all geared up and go really ride one, um, and, and see what they can do through the bumps. Yeah, it, it'd be interesting, you know, to see what it's like, you know, to ride like a real nice 250R or whatever, you know, or something like the newer whatever ones that they're building or anything, just to see what it's like. <laughs> like I said, I just had, I kind of have to this, this interest now in everything about it. So, I mean, yeah, it's it's really cool. It, I mean, it, it they're their guys are innovating parts and making it upside down forks, you know, like the dirt bikes have, uh, they're integrating the better suspension in the rear and, and, and they have so much horsepower. I mean, you, you, you're just, you know, they're riding a 60 horsepower freaking crotch rocket basically. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, like I said, I'm, I'm, I'd be interested in trying one out one day. <laughs> yeah, I think it's I think it's pretty cool. Uh, I'm I'm hopefully going to work with somebody uh, at some point during the year on theirs and um, maybe get a little more involved. I'd I'd like to. Um, so that I think that'll be pretty fun. Um, yeah. So we'll, we'll 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 be I'll keep you up to speed if if something like that comes up. We'll see if you're free and we'll we'll take you out there with us and and, and let you. Uh, but you get a taste for the three wheelers. Yeah, that'd be cool. <laughs> I, 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 I add that to my journal yeah. list. <laughs> there you go. When when did you switch from Suzuki to Honda? Uh, in '88. So yeah, so like '87 when I, when I first started, I had the Suzuki, and then when the '88 came out, that's when I switched switched over to a Honda. Why? Why did you go from the Suzuki to the Honda? Just, you know, from talking to people and everything and, and just looking at what's, what's the better bike and better feel and everything. Um, obviously having the Suzuki and then at that time, you know, knowing the guys who were running like an 87 250R and, you know, Brian, Brian had an 87 and you know, he's telling me a lot about that and, but with the difference with, between the two bikes and everything. So I made that switch and it just so happened that time, uh, my local Honda dealership had a 250 yard that they just got in that day. And I pretty much left with it that night. <laughs> <laughs> did, did they call you tell you they had it or did, or you had already, already told them you wanted one? I kind of already knew they had it there or whatever. I knew that they're getting one. So I was talking to them a little bit about it. So I walk in one day and they're like, oh, hey, Corey, <laughs> look what we just got here. I'm like, oh, I'll be right back. <laughs> yeah, boom. <laughs> don't, don't sell it. Yeah. I, I remember when the 86 250R came out, the quad, and we couldn't get to the local Honda dealer fast enough before they were gone. Yeah. I think, I think, so this was, they're no longer there in existence. This was like, we were Honda Santa Monica and, and, um, I think I bought their, or took their only four 250Rs that they got <laughs> when, when they, mm -hmm. didn't one. they didn't get them all at, at the same time. It's just, you know, cause I had one bike for practicing. Or the first one I had, I was grinding, but I beat the shit out of that thing. So then I got like a newer one for when I ran Mickey's and then, the national bike and other practice bikes. So I had like four of them throughout the whole year. But I think I got probably the only four that they 
that that dealership ever got or sold for that year. Just because Santa mm -hmm. Monica, Santa Monica is not really a spot where they sell a whole lot of dirt bikes back then. Right. No they way. liked you, didn't they? Yeah. <laughs> and then that's that's got, pretty cool stuff. And then when they got the 89s and everything, then I it was the same thing. <laughs> I told them, I came when the 89 comes out, I'd, I'd let me know. And you only got to ride the 89 for, what, a half a season? Three quarters of a season? Well, no, it was, it was 90 by accident. So the, you know, the 89s came out around that whole that whole year in, with the 89s and everything. And then the 90 came around. I had a I had an 89, but at the same time, it being in 90, JP gave me a chassis and everything, which I never put that together. <laughs> because... Or I got it like maybe a month before I went to do the nationals, and then that's when I broke my arm. So I never really had a chance to build that that JP bike. When... And you sold it all, didn't you? Yeah. <laughs> and not today. I wish I would have kept it. <laughs> right? Wouldn't if you only would have known, right? Yeah. Because a lot of people that knew that I had it or know that story, or they're like, "Don't you wish you would have kept it?" Now? I'm like, "Yeah." <laughs> Not so much as that. I wish I would have kept all the parts. Go so overall in general throughout those 89, 88, and, or 88, 89, 90 year, I had uh, like four 88s and six 89s. And, you know, like we say, that I would have kept that JT bike, but I wish I would have kept all the stock OEM parts that I took off those bikes and threw away. <laughs> right? I like the stock exhaust, the heel guards. I mean, the heel guards now, they're like gold. <laughs> If you could find yeah, because them. No, nobody ever kept them. They just tossed them in the trash. The front bumpers, the grab bars, everything. Right. You, know, you can't buy that stuff anymore. So I'm sort of thinking that, man, I, just, I remember just like take, wrenching, taking it, throwing it, you know, here you go. I don't need that. I don't need that. We had no vision that in 30 years people would be you know, beg borrowing, borrowing and stealing for those things, you know, to put OEM pieces back on some of these machines. Yeah, yeah. I got, I got quite a few of them right now myself, 88s and 89s and everything. And you know, I kind of do that whole saying, you know, Rob Peter to pay Paul. So I might find like an 88 and then strip it and take the parts that I want and then sell the rest of it. <laughs> Just so I can make right. the other one over here, you know, all stock 88 or something, or, or you know, the interchangeable 88 parts for an 89, I'll put on there on my 89. Do you go riding, or do you just have them to be a collector? Oh, collector is the right word, but I mean, I just like it, and I want, I want to go riding and everything. I went, I went out one time and everything, you know, I would only... I don't know, kind of like for the last two years, two and a half years, collecting them, whatever, I've been buying them. Uh, but um, my intention is to go out riding and everything. But I found a couple really nice ones, and a lot of people said, they were telling me, like, you can't ride that, but nothing's too nice. I was like, all right. That's kind of like how it all started, where I got like a, where I got a, quite a few of them now. It's just because the ones I found were actually really nice. So it's kind of like, well, I. I, just find, I want to find a one to ride and everything. So I have that now. And, and um, like I said, I have a son. He's 13 years old. And a year ago, was a, year, a year ago, I bought like a little Polaris 90. So I was going to put him on that and ride with him. But the racer in me and everything, I, you know, buying a used one and everything is like, I got to make it perfect for him, you know? So. I started taking it apart so I could replace all the bushings and bearings in it. And I start looking at like a part like, well, this one doesn't look really good. So I was kind of like, all right, I'm going to take it out and get it replated or repowder coat the A-arms and the swing arms and then putting new brakes in it and everything. I'm like, well, this thing looks like, you know, the aluminum's all like oxidized and the, the hubs are all like rusted. So then I got to get these things all vapor blasted. And <laughs> So now it looks like a brand new bike, but I now I, I think I just got the springs back from the painting and everything. So I just got to put the shocks on, and then then we'll be back together. <laughs> sometimes but, doing, sometimes restoring them is funner than riding them. 
Yeah, that's that's what it, that was like a fun thing to do. And I was looking at the engine. I was like, I don't know if I really want to take that thing out because <laughs> the engine's you know it's you know the guy I got it from. He I don't think he he, he might have just like hosed it off real quick. But you know when you know when you when you ride ride them in, in mud and everything, it gets baked on the baked mm -hmm. on there on the engine and everything, and you can't get the dirt off. So that's why. It has like the caked on dirt on there, so it's kind of like like I I want to take it and get it like vapor blasted and, and make it all look good, but there's like nah, that's gonna take a whole nother deal. I'm, I want my son to ride it. It's just a little Polaris ninety. It's not it's not two fifty R with a two fifty R. It'd be taken all apart. <laughs> right, right. I I get it. Let me ask you this question: You got the thrill of riding ATVs and you got to motocross and then TT. You're a, a racer and you've raced at the highest levels that, that anybody could. Is there any comparison from racing the ATV to getting inside of a car and racing? Any, um, I think it's more or less the, the if anything, what, what works with the both is it's, like you mentioned earlier, like butterflies and your nerves and everything, you know, it's just, you have that same mental aspect or mental approach to a race is still the same and how you would go about, I don't know, like if you're doing a national big event like that or something and you're doing an any car race, you know, both of those can be nerve wracking and it's just being over to learn how to, control and, and mentally prepare yourself for that so you're not distracted by nerves or other issues around you to where you just focus on the task at hand as far as the driving aspect you know the physical fitness is the same you know you always get the other athletes and other sports are saying race car drivers are not athletes well it's like it's like how I like to see you jump in a race car and race it for three hours, pulling with like four G's around the turn, which is like four times your body weight. So and, and staying mentally focused, you know, for three hours long in a car that's going over two hundred and twenty miles an hour, you know, to sustain that amount of mental focus and physical fitness is, you know a challenge in itself i mean you know like like football or basketball you know they're running back and forth and they're you know doing their deals and stuff but they have a lot of breaks in between you don't have a break in between driving a race car or doing like a motocross race and everything until after your race is done you're constantly full throttle the whole time so so it's so it's so it's equally you know phys i mean so that misconception is as them saying that race car drivers are are not athletes you know they're they're kind of wrong they are because everyone that i know even i myself would do like triathlons you know on the side deal you know any car drivers do triathlons or like um tony Kanon does iron man's you know that's just the regular basic triathlon but he does like the full 72 mile track or whatever, uh, Ironman's like, like in Hawaii and everything where they swim yeah. two and a half miles and run a marathon and bike like 56 miles. <laughs> and Thank do, like, you. Hours. <laughs> I do the smaller triathlons. I do the ones that only take like an hour, an hour and a half, you know? Yeah, it's okay. Uh, I'm, I'm, I can't run that that far. But um, that's, that's the whole. That's the whole thing they do, though. I, mean, I guess as far as comparison on the physical fitness, the the mental training is, is you know, the mental training is still the same. You know, the physical training is still the same, but you train differently for versus you know with race car driving or probably motocross, right? Riding too, you're not building strength like how they are. Like a football player, you know, they got to be strong. I mean, they're going up against like three hundred pound guys. Whereas IndyCar or road racing or car racing or probably motocross, you're mainly building endurance, you know, stamina and everything, not so much strength, you know, like, like to lift heavy stuff, but you want to be able to sustain that physical fitness for a long period of time. 
but like a super cross race, what's that, 20 minutes? So you need to be all be mentally, physically focused, physically strong. I mean, to run a 20 minute race in a race car, you need to be able to be strong enough to run that on the physical side. But then there's the mental side, and that's the same same aspect, you know, the mental training part of it. So the difference between riding without a cage and a cage is what I was was what I was grasping at, because Doug Eichner was a uh, a rider that I spent a, a large portion of my career with, and when he transitioned to UTVs, um, he finally stopped racing them because he just found no fulfillment in it. He liked being on the back uh, of the motorcycle or the ATV. Um, it was, it was more aggressive and he could do more with it. He could ride the machines harder and he just never could. He could just never drive the, the car like he could ride the quad. Yeah, I can probably see that because it's, you know, riding a quad or a motorcycle, there's a lot of body language in it. You know, you're you're throwing that thing around. It's not just throwing you around, but you're also kind of controlling it by sliding it, throwing it here, throwing it, you know, picking up the front end, going over through whoops and stuff. <laughs> controlling it in the air off big jumps. So you kind of have more control of your bike, whereas a car, you're kind of like a passenger in a sense. But... Mm -hmm. You have to learn how to to drive it. I mean, so I never driven a side by side, but to me, I I, I would adapt. You know, <laughs> you know, we wouldn't have a problem adapting to it. But you know, it'd be probably similar to just driving driving my my stadium sixteen hundred car and everything. So it's on dirt. So like, so I. <laughs> So the, I've been going to one thing that like with the with something on with dirt, you know, with the with the quad or even like a motorcycle, you can like roll into a turn and everything. And then when you want to like really take off and go, you know, you, you can clutch it, you know, slip the clutch and, and just rub it and take off. And I can see where Doug may have had a little bit of that issue there really, because you can't really do that in a car. You can't like you know, go in a turn and you're on the lower RPMs. You can't really clutch it and everything. And I remember like the first few times of me hopping into a road car, you know, it's all about momentum. It's all about, you know, carrying your speed, breaking into a corner and carrying the momentum and the speed around the turn, but on its fine edge. And then exiting the turn really nicely and continuing on the straightaway. And I remember my first few times when I was driving this thing, I, would, I always wanted to like slip the clutch and everything. Just because, like, hey, come on, let's go, let's go. It's like, oh, no, you got to be easy on the throttle and roll on the throttle, roll through the gear. Or, you know, I might have been not really so much in the wrong gear, but I might have slowed down a little more than I wanted to. But kind of like, you know, right. I just kind of want to just tap the clutch and you know, just get on the pipe, you know, like a two stroke and everything. But that it doesn't was, work. It, it doesn't work. It doesn't work because you do that in any car, I think it'll spin out on you. <laughs> and you're, then you're like slept in the wall. But, you know, I, I know we're go ahead i'm sorry go ahead so, so in a sense you know you kind of you know what you so when you're driving you kind of know what you want you just want to throw it in the car this way and everything but you can't do that because one physically you can't do it because you're stopped in the seat and it's not a motorcycle but in your brain you know that's you kind of sit there like that's what you wish you can do is like you know turn turn why is it not turning you know you just want to like pick it outside of it's like like a quad but in a car right. Cars, things just pushing like a pig. You're like, come on, bite, churn, churn. It's like, I know what to do, but I can't. It's a different animal. Right. So you were talking about your mental focus. And when you're going down the straightaway at Indy, are you able to take a breath and relax at all? So I, I've done a lot of training and everything through the help of like who people who I worked with when I got into road racing, like Bob Earl, he's, you know, one of the former Nissan GTP drivers back in the late eighties, early nineties. And, and, uh, and a lot of guys who worked with Nissan, you know, they were actually based out of Vista, California or Oceanside area. And 
So I got to know a lot of those guys and people that work within that work work within that team. So I got connected with them in mid nineties. And one of the guys, his name was Joe Tobin. He told me about this outfit in, in Florida. And at the time they were in Daytona Beach. And they would do like driver analysis, you know, physical and, and mental analysis on, on you. And they have a database of a bunch of people who went through the program, like other drivers who are in your class of whatever you're racing. So when I went through it, I mean, I mean, every, pretty much every IndyCar driver has gone to the program. So they have a huge database. And so what they do is they don't tell you who the people are, but they just have the average and everything. And they just compare you to people who you're competing with, like on physical strength, mental strength, so that you have an idea of where your competitors are. And then they help you um, build a program, uh, like a fitness program, a diet program, and mental training programs, you know, you know, how to mentally prepare yourself for, for competition, how to mentally, mentally, um, control your aggressions and everything. And it's actually really interesting because they have these computers, you know, it's, it's all about like visual. It's all about like timing reaction and all that stuff. So they have this equipment to where you could learn how to see your reaction time, see how long it takes for you to identify, like a, they have a spot on the computer, like just spots like popping up and you have to tap it. So what they're testing there is seeing how long it takes for you to scan, to find it, two, to react, to push it, and three, to process the whole thing. And it's all timing there. And so they can evaluate all the numbers later and then compare it to the other guys who are in their database. Then they kind of show you where that is. And their skills that they have to where they, they train you for that, to better improve your scanning capabilities and your, your processing and your reactions and everything. Because it, it's, you know, because that's what you're doing the whole time. I don't, you know, whether you're racing an ATV or racing a car, you're constantly looking around. You know, you're always looking for your breaking points. You're always looking for something on the track or trying to feel something on the track that's, that's different or you didn't notice before. Because you have to, I mean, when you go out and practice, you go out, run maybe three, four laps, come back in the pits, radio to the guys, what's wrong with the car, and you have to identify and tell them what's going on. And then they'll make the change and they'll send you back out, run three laps and come back in. You know, you don't go out there and just run however many laps you want and come in. You know, you, you, know, you go in and out as fast as you can. So you got to be able to pick everything up on one lap or two laps and feel for the car. On the quad, if some of dirt bike, I mean, if you can do that, like, you know, go out and use your practice sessions and go out and run like two laps if you're trying to dial in your bike and be able to figure out all these things <laughs> and what to pay, pay attention to. I mean, I understand motocross, you got the track changes every lap, but that's all comes to scanning and everything and reacting and be able to pick that up and something, you know, that changes a lot. So like that is a incredible way of talking about it. It sounds to me like they're tuning you and your crew is tuning the car. Yeah. So so in a sense, when you when they when they work with you with the, the mental training, the mental processing and everything, you're far more relaxed. I mean, you know what I mean you know, you know what to look for and how to prepare yourself. It's not as like nerve wracking, you know, when you show up at a track and everything that would distract you from what you have to do. So like when you asked about, well, you know, are you relaxed or have time to breathe? You know, the mind, mind over matter in a sense, you know, you're, your body will keep going. You know, like they say, you know, when you work out and everything, it's like your mind will give up before your body gives up. So what they try to do is is equal that out to where you're, where you're physically and mentally strong and that's where you're like 
fully focused because it's very easy to, when you're fatigued, it's very easy to lose that concentration. And then once you start losing concentration, that's when you start making mistakes. So in a sense for a motocross rider, that's probably the best tool you could have right there is, is to become mentally strong and everything, you know, yeah, we all have good days and bad days and you can be on the track struggling because he didn't get a good night's sleep because he just flew in from a town where from your hometown and your plane got canceled delayed got in at 12 o'clock midnight and you have to be on a truck like eight in the morning then right. you're just physically tired and everything but if you are totally mentally prepared you could you know overcome that and everything yeah so, so like me i mean just a quick story on at indianapolis you know, like I said earlier, my first time walking out the gasoline alley from the garage onto the main street, you have to do rookie orientation when you're first time going there. I think I mentioned in the in the, the last time about rookie orientation is that you have to um when we're talking about lower speeds and everything, you have to run 10 laps consistently at at certain speeds. So I think you have to do that like I remember like 180 to 190. You have to run 10 laps of that consistently, not faster, not slower. It has to be in that range. Once you do that, then you jump up to the next speed, 190 to 200, 10 laps. And then once you clear that, then you have to do 200 to 210, 10 laps. And then after that, I think they just let you run 10 laps above 210. Now, it's 10 miles an hour. You think, oh, I could click that out. It's, you know, that's only a difference of maybe like a quarter of a second. So that's how consistent you have to be to hold that speed consistently, like run 181, 182, 181, 182. Even though you want to push the throttle and go faster, even though you know you can go faster in the turn because the car will do 230 miles an hour around the track. Oh, that's insane. So you're, so you're holding back your, your adrenaline. You're holding back your, it's like, ah, I want to go faster, but no, I got to just, you know, keep myself calm. So that's what they're doing. So on rookie orientation day, we're doing all this, all those things to, to get your approval to even be able to be, I guess, invited or to be able to enter for the race. So you have to pass that. And once, you know, I, I passed it and everything, and it was, I think it was like the week before the 500 or the month of May, because it's all well, back, it's different today, but back then it's the whole month of May, you know, all four weeks. But now, right. now it still is, but they shorten Indy's time to two weeks because they throw a road race before it. So it is the whole month of May, but the first two weeks is a road race on, on the Grand Prix track in the infield, then they have Indy right after that. But when I did it, when it was the whole month of May, they had regular rotation the week before, and then May, the first weekend of May, that's when they start all the practices. And now we're here with everybody and everything. And when I walked out to Gaston Valley, because it's a whole different animal. I mean, it's, you know, it's the attention that's around the whole event, you know, just the fans and everything. I mean, if you, all the equipment on pit lane and you're walking out there for your first time out there, you're just like, holy shit. <laughs> you know, it's kind of like me. I was like shocked. So you get all these distractions and everything. And then you're going around the track and you're like, wow, I'm really doing this. <laughs> and I remember talking to like Al Unser Jr. and Johnny Rutherford. Johnny Rutherford is like my hero. I mean, if there's if there's any driver that I idolize or will always know watch when I was little, it was Johnny Rutherford. And I remember talking to the two of them because they're they're around. I mean, I mean those guys are, are like legends and everything, but they're around all the Indy car races and everything as like advice advice for drivers or anything, you know. They're they're there to help you, you know, to to feel comfortable. And, or give pointers or if you have questions about something and so they were telling me you know approach this corner this way and do this and do that or where i was watching you is like no you're 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 entering really nice but try to carry more speed through here and they're giving me their techniques and so as i was like, getting comfortable in the car when i knew i was comfortable and relaxed <laughs> so indianapolis is, or the speedway is 
I think it's on like the west side and everything. And the airport is on the south south side of or the south part of Indianapolis. Because the, the freeway system you know, is like a big circle around around Indianapolis where the main highway is. So the south part is the airport and the speedway is like on the west side, look halfway up, I guess. And the planes come over the speedway on approach at the airport. And going down the front straightaway, as I'm coming down out of turn four onto the front straightaway, I'm seeing like little specks up over here. And I'm like, well, what the hell is that? So the next lap I go around, I don't see it. And the next lap I go around, now I see like a little speck right here. And then I'm going like this, looking like that. I was like, oh, that's an airplane. <laughs> <laughs> and so I'm thinking, I, I got to be pretty comfortable right now because if I'm noticing like an airplane right here that's bothering me, this little speck in the sky, a little black dot, and then, you know, like here I'm going 220 miles an hour down the straightaway and everything, you know, going into a turn that I'm noticing an airplane here. I was like, oh, I think I should be focused right here. What's, what's going on? But you know, you do get comfortable and relaxed and start noticing stuff like that, you know, believe it or not, or you see, like, not really you can pick out a person, but you might see someone wearing, like, a bright yellow shirt or something, but where it's like, you see them every time you go by, you can notice these things. The, the airplane thing was a trip because, so as I saw it and noticed it there, so as the time was going on and throughout the days at, at Indy, and it's getting faster and faster, we're qualifying like you know over 200, 225, 227 at that time. That when you're coming down the straightaway, I noticed that not only the spec was there, but then I noticed the spec was like going like this, going behind me. And then I started to realize, like, well, wait a minute, a plane lands on approach at about 200 miles an hour. You know, I'm going down the stairway, 230 and everything. I'm going faster than the plane. <laughs> then, that's, then that's when I was like, holy shit. <laughs> yeah. So that was that was just kind of like, I mean, that, that's like one of my my first time story going there and everything that I noticed. I, mean, I always tell that to people. I mean, that's, when I, that's, you know, kind of putting in perspective of how fast that you're going. And then like what you said, you know, being comfortable and relaxed and you have a breather. So in a sense, you do have a little breathing time, but like I mentioned earlier, a lap time is about 38 seconds around the track. You are in a, you're in a corner about 55, I think mathematically 55% of the time you're in a turn. So it's almost like, you know, half that, like, 18 seconds or whatever, you're in a turn, then release, turn, release, turn, release. So you're pulling at, you're pulling almost four G's in a turn. I mean, four times your body weight. So if you just weigh a hundred pounds, I don't weigh more than that, but if you weigh a hundred pounds, that's four times your body weight. And so for a 500 mile race that takes about three and a half hours long, you're doing that just, you know, like I said, you're in a turn every you know, 30 seconds of one lap. So the physical fitness of that, you know, you have to sustain that for three and a half hours and be mentally focused because at those speeds, you cover a football field in, in one second. So, I mean, that's is your, does your neck hurt afterwards? You know, with, with all the training, no. I mean, it's just, you know, little strain, little, little, little whatever, you know. Um, uh, fatigue, but not like not hurt or because you're you're you got a horseshoe around your head or like a head not really like a headrest, but it's, well, it's kind of like a, it is a headrest, but it's also for safety and everything in case you crash. Um, but your head's like it goes right up to your to your helmet, so it just sits right there and everything to where it supports um, your head from falling. Right. Um, well, didn't they put a didn't they put a device on the on the helmet? It's to it, so when a driver would would the, the wrong side of the car would hit the wall, it would keep them from moving that direction too far. They have a Hansa device that they, they, they have the drivers wear, um, 
it's uh, kind of like a horseshoe that goes around your around your neck and everything. You're right. And it just comes down like right right over your shoulders and down. And, it, and then your seatbelts overlap that. Then in the back, it has, let's see if I have a helmet right here. No, I don't. But on, on the back, it, it goes up like like a, like a cup like this. So when your, your helmet kind of sits right here to the back of it. And then this mm -hmm. part is up against the, the, I guess, the back of the car or the headrest right there. Right. So the Hans device is, sits up against that, and then your helmet goes, is curved with it. Right. And it has two tethers that goes to the helmet on the sides and everything. And it only leaves, leaves your head to move forward, probably with like, you know, just enough to go like that. So it doesn't go too far forward. So if you have like a frontal impact or in an angle or sideways, your head doesn't go smack the steering wheel or or farther than, than it naturally should go you also told me that you had did you, did you ever crash a car at indy i yeah <laughs> i guess I, I got a got a flat tire going in the shirt was it flat tire I don't remember if it was a flat tire going into turn one during a practice session. And um, turn, turn one is always the, the tricky corner at the speedway because there's every turn is identical, is what they say. And everything, even like the others and everybody will say they're all the same. It's just a whole different look in every corner because of the stands and the bleachers. And turn one is the only turn that you're coming down the straightaway, you can see where it goes in. But you can't see the exit of the corner. All the other trains, you can see the exit of the corner when you're approaching it. And the bleachers on the outside of the turn are like tall, really tall. I mean, there's like two two levels, and then the suites above it, barely. But in between, there's a gap. And depending if it's a windy day, there's you know like a like a wind tunnel going through there. So it has its own tricky moments in there. And, I'm not sure if I was caught out through like a like a gust of wind that blew through there, or if I got a flat tire, but I lost it. And usually, most cars, if they're going to crash, it's always in turn one. Um, I wasn't up to speed at that time. I was like probably the earlier days of that month of May, and car just came around the rear end, just came around and slid sideways all the way down just completely sideways all the way down the, through the what they call a short shoot which is just like a little straightaway between turn one and turn two but it was kept on sliding sideways all the way down and just sucked into the inside of the turn of the, of the track and everything and i hit the inside wall i was only going 80 miles an hour when i hit it so it wasn't going that fast but i hit it like perfect <laughs> to where it pushed the nose of the cone inward so when you looked we took the nose coming off you're looking inside of it and it was like reverse it was like sticking that way and there was <laughs> and it didn't even break the front wing off or anything because the nose the very pointy part of the nose sticks out farther than, than the actual wings so i mean i i hit it squared on straight and everything and then uh and they just pushed in the nose like six inches and it was just like it, i mean like i say it wasn't wasn't um I don't think you're hitting any more square than that. That's pretty cool, man. That's pretty cool. Hey, Corey, I really appreciate you sitting down and talking with us again. I liked getting more about your career in ATVs. We always seem to get off topic sometimes, but some of the things that you tell us and, and talk to us about your career are so intriguing. It's, it's hard not to, uh, to get caught up in those conversations and those stories. Um, most people don't get the inside scoop on what it's like to be in a race car driver, let alone a guy that's raced Indy cars. So I, I really appreciate you telling us about those things and uh, letting us in on the secrets behind the scenes. Yeah, yeah, no, it's it's an awesome. It was an awesome opportunity. It was an awesome, awesome deal and everything. To like I said, I started off with quads and everything and. And to do everything that I've done in between that and, and IndyCar, everything in the middle, I mean, it, it's it's great. You know, quads is where I started. And, you know, I like I talked to Brian Fry and told him when we met up like a couple of years ago, um, I went to his house and watched Supercross. And I, I told him, like, dude, you kind of set my foundation. 
you know, you kind of said, you sent me or got me pointed in the right direction because my family's not, you know, a racing family. You know, they rode dirt bikes, you know, when they're younger even with my older brothers and sisters before I came around. But, but as far as any knowledge of racing, they had no knowledge of that. And so Brian kind of taught me a lot of that and they took me around and what he taught me kind of extended through all the different cars and off-road cars and and open wheel cars and indie car and stock cars and stuff i approached every new 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 um adventure doing the same mental mindset and everything so that's, I, that's I told, so I, cool i kind of credit like what i've been able to do is because of you you kind of set me what what to look for and, and how to approach it so i mean he helped me a lot, and like I said, we're 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 still good friends and everything, and we talk to each other a lot and everything in the last last you know couple of years and everything. So that's pretty cool stuff. But the um, one thing, like, so so actually, you know, I forgot to say one thing. But the one thing, like like you're talking about the mental and physical training thing. My one my one training thing for for uh for mental training is playing golf. Because golf is one game. Doesn't matter how good you are or how bad you are. One golf is or one playing golf is like the most mental game you can probably play, and the most challenging game to try not to get frustrated. Because you never like your swing, you never like your hit, or where it's going to land. But it's overcoming that and everything, and still try to par the hole. So you might have a bad tee shot and slice it and everything, and people get you can watch all the golfers they get mad. But it's over controlling that anger and frustration where you now have to focus on okay now what i'm going to do to get the hole back on the fairway or on the green and everything and still try to par or better your score from the last time so it, so my mental training i played golf like two three times a week when i was racing there and just one to get away from racing and clear my head because it's it's kind of a stress reliever but at the same time it was my mental training part and everything to try to stay focused you know for like four hours and playing around the golf how i relaxed my relaxation was sitting on an airplane <laughs> when i was racing yeah. when you're racing the indy car i mean like i always tell people one third of my time was racing one third of my time was maybe at home and one third of my time was in a plane flying someplace but the only time where I was able to decompress and be stress free from everything was sitting on the plane. Yeah, no phone. You can't do nothing. That's just no you just that's it. And the best thing wasn't because I flew so much. I was an American Airlines executive platinum member, so I got upgraded for every flight. So oh, I just nice. took the first class and fly everywhere. You know, paying coach fare, and then I got upgraded. You know, like I said, because I was on their top tier of their of their program. So getting out here was no problem. So I just sit there and I got to know all the flight attendants. So they see me walking down the jet bridge. They already have my glass of wine right there and <laughs> waiting for me. <laughs> and ask me, like, do we race or do you come back from uh, testing or promotions? I'm like, racing. <laughs> so that's so cool. That that is pretty cool that they that they knew who you were and, and uh, knew what you did. And that's awesome. All the, to this day, all my friends love traveling with me when we go go places because they like you know all the ins and outs of every airport. But it's like I spend many hours in every airport in the country <laughs> and know the hotels and know, and know how the air, how the airlines work and everything. Well, yeah, as much traveling as you did, you you would. Yeah. My, yeah. my my only tip to people is this: you got to be nice. You gotta be nice to the the, ticket, the people at the ticket encounter, regardless of how frustrated you are, because the guy before you pissed them off, and if you're nice to them, they're gonna help you out. <laughs> right. That's how you get upgraded. <laughs> look, look, yeah, just be nice. Look for the angry guy at the ticket encounter and get in that line next, and be really nice. <laughs> and then, and then, and then they'll upgrade you. Yeah. Then they'll then they'll be nice because now you're cool, and then they're like, ah, okay, find somebody nice. <laughs> that's awesome stuff the team here at ATV Talk would love your feedback please email us at hello at ATVTalkPodcast.com 
If you're in need of a consultation for your current racing program, a custom ATV, or an industry guest speaker, I have the company for you. Duncan Technologies International Inc. offers host, MC, and guest speaking services at events, builds custom ATVs for recreational riding or racing around the world, and they offer consulting services for professional teams or individual racers. Send inquiries to duncantechinternational at gmail.com or call 619-716-1532 for more information. Thank you for listening. We hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, don't forget to share us with your family and friends. The podcast is available on all streaming platforms, and you can find us on social media as ATV Talk Podcast. We're on Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, YouTube, Rumble, and Twitter. 